Hey, welcome back. This is Dr. Suchard again with a presentation about N-acetylcysteine, which corresponds with Antidotes in Depth, Chapter A3 in Goldfrank's Toxicologic Emergencies. The learning objectives for this topic are that when you finish studying the related materials, you should be able to explain the mechanism, or better yet, mechanisms, of action of N-acetylcysteine in treating acetaminophen toxicity, outline the standard N-acetylcysteine dosing regimens when given orally or intravenously, and identify at least two potential complications of antidotal NAC therapy. As already mentioned in our discussion about acetaminophen, N-acetylcysteine is the standard therapy for acetaminophen overdose. N-acetylcysteine is just a minor modification of cysteine, the essential amino acid, where there is an addition of an acetyl group to the nitrogen, or N, of the amino group, hence it's N-acetyl cysteine, commonly abbreviated as NAC. And it works primarily by replenishing glutathione stores, but there are other mechanisms of action as well. This figure shows that it's just a few metabolic steps to get from N-acetyl cysteine to reduce glutathione. This will replete the glutathione stores that are being depleted, allowing for continued detoxification of NAPKI. This helps to treat or to prevent hepatotoxicity with acetaminophen overdose. Here again is NAC acting as a precursor to glutathione. The NAC is bound to glutamate and then to glycine, two other amino acids, to make the tripeptide glutathione. NAC has some additional mechanisms of action in treating acetaminophen overdose. NAC itself is a potential reducing agent since it has a sulfhydryl group on it and it can directly conjugate and reduce NAPKI similarly to how this works with glutathione. NAC also acts as a substrate for APAP sulfation, and it has a range of antioxidant effects that modulate and tone down the cascade of inflammatory events occurring as a result of NAPKI-induced cellular injury. NAC can be given enterally, that is, either by mouth, PO, or through a tube into the GI tract. The Food and Drug Administration approved enteral NAC in 1985, although it had been commonly used to treat acetaminophen overdose for several years by that point. NAC had also been given intravenously for some years before FDA approval, but there had been no commercial product labeled for IV use in the U.S. What typically happened in those days when they wanted to use IV NAC as an antidote was to take either generic anacetylcysteine or mucomist, a brand name preparation of NAC for nebulization in patients with pulmonary disease, and run it through a micropore filter before giving it IV. In 2004, the FDA approved an IV formulation of NAC called acetidote, as in antidote for acetaminophen. Both methods of NAC administration are very effective. In fact, they're both so good that it's hard to impossible to show that one method of administration, PO versus IV, produces better clinical outcomes than the other. Here is the FDA approved dosing regimen for enteral NAC. The patient is given a loading dose of 140 mg per kilogram and acetylcysteine. And this is followed by 17 more doses of 70 mg per kilogram NAC given every 4 hours, for a total treatment regimen lasting 72 hours, 3 days. As already stated, PO NAC is quite effective in preventing and treating acetaminophen-induced hepatotoxicity. But there are some potential downsides, including the treatment regimen lasts 3 whole days, during which time that patient will presumably need to stay in the hospital to best ensure compliance and for monitoring. And recall from the previous discussion that a relatively small percent of APAP overdose patients will develop hepatotoxicity with abnormally elevated liver labs. So that's a lot of patients hanging around in the hospital for a while, assuming you're following the standard treatment protocol. The dosing occurs every four hours, and this includes waking the patient up all through the night, so they're never getting much uninterrupted sleep. And NAC itself smells moderately bad, a bit sulfurous like rotten eggs, and can induce nausea even if you aren't smelling it. Some authorities recommend diluting it in some flavored liquid such as cola and serving it in a covered cup through a straw so the patient doesn't have to smell it. So administering NAC-PO is not necessarily the easiest task, and if the patient truly wishes self-harm, they have plenty of reasons to avoid being compliant. On these next two slides, I'm showing data collected from U.S. Poison Control Centers regarding the number of reported uses of NAC by method of administration. Here in 1985 is when PO-NAC was FDA approved, and here is 2004 when IV-NAC was approved. And you can see that the number of reported uses of PO is going up and up, presumably from better data capture, 
But then right around the time that IVNAC was approved, there was an abrupt shift with more and more times that N-acetylcysteine was given intravenously instead. That same information from the previous slide is seen here on the left. But now we're including further annual data showing the incidence of IV administration continuing to increase. IV finally overtook PONAC in 2007. In 2021, IVNAC was used about 15 times more often than PO. And FDA-approved IVNAC dosing involves a three-bag regimen. Here is that three-bag regimen. Similar to the PO dosing, the IV regimen starts with a loading dose that is followed by ongoing lower doses. The IV loading dose is 150 mg per kilogram NAC given over one hour. Then the second IV bag is 50 mg per kilogram NAC total given over four hours. And then a third bag of 100 mg per kilogram is given over the next 16 hours. On this slide, I'll be showing you some partial screenshots from EPIC, the electronic medical record system we use at UCI Medical Center in Orange. The EPIC order set encourages, or one might even say forces you, to use the three-bag regimen. All you need to do is insert the patient's weight, and that should probably already be in the chart by the time you're ordering medications. This system also automatically includes the amount of IV fluid into which the NAC gets diluted. I think it's a pretty good idea to have a system that makes it hard to order the NAC incorrectly. We've seen that IV NAC is given a lot more commonly than PO, presumably to avoid those potential difficulties with PO dosing just discussed. But IV NAC can also be complicated by side effects and various administration errors. Anaphylactoid reactions to NAC are fairly common, but fortunately are easily treatable. And a whole slew of dosing errors can happen, which are amazingly common, but of unclear clinical import. Anaphylactoid reactions are due to non-IgE-mediated mast cell degranulation, as opposed to anaphylactic reactions, which are immune-mediated. Anaphylactoid reactions can occur with NAC and are related to the rate of administration, occurring more commonly the faster you give the medication. Early IV NAC protocols called for the loading dose to occur over 15 minutes, but this was later changed to a full hour to reduce the incidence of NAC-induced nausea and vomiting, rash, flushing, and itching. More severe reactions can occur, but are quite rare. And it's also possible to have anaphylactoid reactions to PO NAC, but the incidence there is quite low. Adverse reactions to IV NAC are actually fairly common if you look for them, but they are rarely life-threatening or require discontinuation of NAC therapy altogether. In a study looking at 15-minute versus a 60-minute loading dose time, there were fewer reactions with the longer load time. Another study shown in the pie chart here showed that no adverse effects were noted with IV NAC only about a third of the time. If a patient experiences adverse effects from IV NAC, you should stop the infusion and treat the patient just like you would for any similar allergic reaction. Most patients will then be able to tolerate restarting the IV NAC, although you may need to proceed at a slower rate. This is mostly an issue with the loading dose and not with the later maintenance bags of IV NAC. IV NAC administration errors are common. The study quoted here summed this up saying, the complicated regimen, length of therapy, and need for multiple health professionals to administer doses of an infrequently used drug at multiple treatment sites in the hospital potentiate the possibility of medication errors. Not only are administration errors common, but they come in many forms, including underdosing, overdosing, giving NAC that's too dilute, resulting in fluid overload and hyponatremia, sometimes so severe it results in seizures. There are also unintended interruptions in therapy. Per protocol, there should be no time between the first bag, the IV NAC loading dose, and the second bag, and between the second bag and the third. However, if all the bags are ordered and prepared at once, as per the UCI Medical Center EPIC order set, and follow the patient through the hospital, this can be mitigated. In the same 2008 study I've already been quoting, the researchers found errors in IV NAC administration in one-third of patients and found several patients had more than one error. The most common kinds of error were interruptions in therapy and some patients getting NAC where it wasn't actually indicated. These errors occurred more commonly in the emergency department, where it's usually quite chaotic compared to elsewhere in the hospital, and more commonly during night shift. On the other hand, there's no good evidence that anyone was harmed by these administration errors. Here's data from a UK study showing disturbing variability in IV NAC dosing. They looked at the NAC doses given to patients and compared it to the doses they should have gotten by weight, 
which would be at the 100% mark on the x-axis on this graph. They found that only 37% got within 10% of the intended dose. 17 doses among 66 patients were more than 50% off, but then again, there was no evidence of harm from these dosing errors. Because of all the ways that errors can occur, many alternative IV NAC regimens have been created that might reduce complexity and the incidence of adverse drug reactions. The next two slides are some examples, but please don't memorize these alternate treatment protocols. They're only being provided for some additional illustration. The high yield stuff to learn about NAC dosing are the previously described standard PO and IV NAC protocols. Two bag regimens are formally recommended in the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. This is called SNAP, standing for the Scottish and Newcastle Acetylcysteine Protocol. They start with a 100 milligram per kilogram bag as a slower loading dose over two hours, followed by 200 milligrams per kilogram, so the total dose is the same as we use in the US, over the next 10 hours. By giving a slower loading dose, the incidence of vomiting, retching, or requiring rescue meds, like antiemetics, I guess, was decreased. Even some single bag regimens exist. The pharmacist only needs to mix up a single bag of IV NAC but the administration rate has to change after the loading dose portion is complete. Such a protocol decreased unintended interruptions in treatment, presumably because no one was ever waiting for the next bag of meds to show up. But once all is said and done, there's no strong evidence favoring any alternate number of bags regimen. I interpret this as Mikey likes it level of evidence, where everything is equivalent enough that you're free to choose whichever method you like. It would be difficult to impossible to prove which regimen optimizes clinical outcome. NAC works very well no matter how you give it. And maybe our choices therefore should be based on reducing errors or adverse drug reactions or perhaps even reducing legal risk. We've already talked about the rumac matthew nomogram, which can help determine when to initiate NAC therapy. But when do we stop an acetylcysteine therapy? You might think, well, we stop when the FDA-approved dosing protocol is done, but that's often not the case. For PO-NAC dosing, you'll recall that this is a 72-hour protocol, which might be inconvenient for several reasons. And you should also recall that only a small percentage of patients admitted for APAP overdose will develop hepatotoxic abnormal labs. This means that there will be a lot of otherwise stable patients hanging out in the hospital for perhaps one or two days longer than they really needed to. Toward the end of the PONAC era, many poison centers and toxicologists had adopted patient-tailored therapy. The indications to start NAC were the same, and they were given the standard loading dose of 140 mg per kilogram, followed by 70 mg per kilogram every four hours. But if they had been treated for, per some recommendations, at least 20 hours, five or six doses, and they were clinically well, tolerating a PO diet and without right upper quadrant abdominal pain, their liver labs were normal, and there was no longer any detectable APAP, then the PONAC could be discontinued and the patient cleared for discharge or for transfer to psych as appropriate. Switching over to IV NAC, it's certainly true that a large proportion of acetaminophen overdose patients will only need 21 hours of IV NAC, since a lot of them do just great. But we don't stop IV NAC at 21 hours just because the protocol is done. Here's a quote from the Goldfrank chapter where they recommend continuing the NAC protocol at the final rate of 6.25 milligrams per kilogram per hour, until the acetaminophen concentration is undetectable, there is no evidence of hepatic failure, and the AST, if it has elevated, has significantly decreased, which they suggest means two consecutive AST levels with decreasing values, and these values are below 1,000 international units per liter. And if you happen to be using PONAC, the same continuation of therapy would hold true there, until the patient had met the same criteria to discontinue it. And finally, an acetylcysteine may also be indicated to treat or prevent hepatotoxicity from a few other agents, including cyclopeptide-containing mushrooms, carbon tetrachloride, and pennyroyal. Pennyroyal is an herb containing the molecule pulagone, which is converted in the liver into a toxic metabolite in a very similar manner to acetaminophen. Pennyroyal can be found in some natural and actually effective flea treatments for dogs and cats, and it also has a reputation for inducing abortion, which it definitely can do, but it can also damage the maternal liver in the process if not dosed precisely. And so pennyroyal may be misused by persons seeking alternative methods to terminate a pregnancy. 
All right, we're done with our discussion about N-acetylcysteine as an antidote. I'll be seeing you around.